Thank you for joining us today. This is the first session of the webinar entitled Remote Sensing of Coastal Ecosystems. My name is Juan Torres Perez, and today, and to the rest of, the, of this series, I'll be accompanied by my colleague, Amber McCollum, from the NASA Ames Research Center. As a reminder, this webinar consists of three one-hour sessions, which will be given on August 25th, so today, September 1st, and September 8th. The same content will be presented on two different times on each day, at 11 a.m. and 2 p.m. Eastern Time U.S. The morning session is going to be in English, and the afternoon session is going to be in Spanish. You only need to sign up for one of the sessions on each day. Also, you can access all the course materials at the web page shown on the screen. This includes the PowerPoint presentations and a homework assignment, which will be available on the last day of the webinar series. There, there will be time for questions and answers at the end of, the, of each session, but feel free to add your questions to the live chat at any time during this presentation. And you may also submit your questions to the emails shown on the screen, my email and Amber's emails. There is one homework assignment to complete this course, which will need to be submitted via Google Forms. As with most RSET courses, remember that the homework will not become available on the course website until the last day, so on September 8th. To obtain the certificate of completion, you need to attend the live webinars, either in English or Spanish, and submit the assignment on or before September 22nd, so two weeks after the last session. So keep in mind that because of the high volume of participants that usually attend these webinars, it takes approximately two months to receive the certificates. So you will get them eventually. Now, Keep in mind that this is an introductory course, but we, either way, we recommend the fundamentals of remote sensing course that we have on the RSET website, or to have an equivalent experience as a prerequisite. Again, all the course materials for this particular webinar are available on the course website shown on the screen. Now let's talk a little bit about the RSET program. The Applied Remote Sensing Training Program, or RSET, is under the umbrella of the Capacity Building Program at NASA, which at the same time is under the Applied Sciences Program. The purpose of RSET is to help build the skills to acquire and use available NASA satellite and model data for decision support. We provide in-person and online trainings, which are intended for policymakers, the academia, NGOs, and other applied sciences professionals who want to incorporate NASA remote sensing techniques and tools into their daily activities. We provide introductory, intermediate, and advanced trainings on a variety of topics within the areas of air and water quality, disasters, land, and water resources. Okay, now on today's course. As I mentioned, this is an introductory course. We will focus today, today's session on an overview of major tropical and temperate coastal ecosystems. And we'll talk about some satellite sensors typically used for analyzing these ecosystems. By the way, we're not gonna be able to cover all different types of coastal ecosystems today, but we are already planning on future trainings on those that we will not be able to cover on this course. Lastly, today we will do a very short introduction to water quality as a sneak peek of next week's session, which will be entirely dedicated to light penetration in the water column and how it affects the retrieval of information from the seafloor. During the last week, we will then present an overview of shorelines and how remote sensing and in-situ techniques can be complemented for the mapping and analysis of these uh, areas. <clears throat> 
it is, our, it is our expectation that by the end of this session, you'll be able to identify major coastal and temperate, uh, temperate in, and tropical areas and their characteristics. And for instance, the image on the right shows an extent, the extension of the coral reef platform in Papua New Guinea in the coral triangle in the Indo-Pacific, a particularly beautiful area. We also, we're also gonna present some information on the spectral differences in some of the benthic components, in, particularly in coral reef ecosystems and other, uh, and other uh, coastal ecosystems. And you'll also be able to identify some of the main satellites and sensors typically used for remote sensing of these ecosystems. Now, why is it important to study coastal ecosystems? Well, coastal ecosystems are vital for the sustenance of millions of people on a worldwide basis. For people living in small islands, for example, coastal and marine ecosystems provide more than half of the daily food supplies. The beauty of many of these coastal ecosystems is unquestionable. And they provide for recreational activities such as scuba diving and skin diving, swimming, water sports, fishing, or just simply spending a day with the family at the beach. In terms of their ecological importance, coastal and marine ecosystems provide habitat for thousands of different species, including plants, protists, or single cell organisms, invertebrates, and vertebrates. So pretty much the whole animal kingdom is represented in different, different coastal ecosystems, from the very simple sponges to the big marine mammals. All of these species are either threatened, or a lot of these species are either threatened or endangered because of human activities. So studying these ecosystems from diverse point of view has become an imperative if we are to try to save most of these species. Coastal ecosystems also provide protection to, sh uh, to the shoreline, functioning as natural barriers against wave action through the, through the year, but particularly during strong storms or hurricanes. Now let's talk about some of the major factors that affect coastal ecosystems, and we're gonna start with some climate factors. During extreme events, such as hurricanes, storms, or significant rain events, tons of sediments from the different regions of the watersheds end up in nearshore coastal ecosystems. Furthermore, the brute force of extreme events, such as hurricanes, can literally destroy vast areas of mangroves, for example. Vast uh, wave action in particular, resulting from uh, the cyclonic surge can bury extensive coral reef areas in shallow waters. For example, this was the case in the island of Culebra in Puerto Rico, uh, uh, for instance, when during uh, Hurricane Maria in 2017, hundreds of colonies of the threatened stackhorn coral in particular were literally buried alive by the sand suspended, pre-suspended, and eventually deposited on the seafloor. Needless to say that most of those colonies eventually died. The increasing global temperatures and the melting of polar ice caps is also causing an un unprecedented increase in sea level. Some keystone marine organisms and ecosystem engineers, such as reef corals, they actually depend on the availability of light to grow as they have a symbiotic relationship with a microscopic algae known as Sosantelli. Through photosynthesis, the Sosantelli produces organic matter, which the coral uses for its own metabolism and to aid in building their, skeleton, their calcium uh, carbonate skeletons. Corals are generally slow growers. They typically grow, have an average growth of about one centimeter a year. And this creates a problem with sea level rise as these organisms may not be able to keep up with the increase in sea level. Ocean acidification also presents an issue for calcifying organisms in the ocean. This applies to thousands of animal species and even, uh, even some calcifying algae as well, as their skeletons may become too fragile with a more acidic ocean. Increases in sea surface temperature are the main cause of what is known as coral bleaching. And you have, a, there's a photo here 
that shows, uh, for those of you who have not seen coral bleaching before, the photo here shows uh, one, a bleached coral colony in between two colonies that are uh, relatively healthy. So you see the differences in colors there. So when corals are exposed uh, to extreme temperatures, the relationship between corals and the sosanteli is disrupted. And either the sosanteli lose their pigments or the coral exposes their sosanteli or might be a combination of both. This weakens the coral colony and provides for, for a potential invasion of other opportunistic organisms, such as fleshy algae or cyanobacteria, which overgrows the weakened coral and eventually kills it. The frequency, frequency and severity of bleaching events has increased in the last decades. With the 2014 to 2017 coral bleaching event being probably the biggest and most devastating bleaching event on recorded history. Changes in ocean currents may bring unusually cold waters to tropical areas. Therefore, increasing the concentration of nutrients in the water column triggers the proliferation of opportunistic fleshy or filamentous algae in areas where they do not usually occur. A new case was just reported for the northwestern north Hawaiian islands a few weeks ago, where a new previously undescribed species of red algae, which was recently described as Chondria tumulosa, spread through the, particularly through the Pearl and Hermes Atoll, killing thousands of coral colonies. In temperate zones, changes in ocean currents can provide for the development of half algal blooms, depleting the concentration of oxygen in the, in the water and affecting the local fauna. This was the case a few years ago along the California coast, where one of these events put the whole abalone industry in danger. And finally, we're seeing an increase in the number of, of diseases developing in coastal ecosystems, most likely as a consequence of climate change. The stony coral tissue loss disease, for instance, is one, of, is one case which started in Florida a few years ago and has spread through the Caribbean in a matter of a couple of years. Now let's talk a little bit about some local factors that also affect coastal ecosystems. Changes in land use and land cover because of anthropogenic actions through the watershed cause, causes increases in sedimentation and eutrophication, which is the increase in nutrient load, loading, particularly affecting the underwater flora and fauna of coastal ecosystems. As I mentioned in the previous slide, Increases in eutrophication can also lead to harm from algal blooms events, which deplete the oxygen in the water column, and depending on the organism, can also be detrimental to the health of the animals, including humans. The photo on, on the that you see here on the on the right shows uh, the the extent of a river plume in the west coast of Puerto Rico right after an extreme rain event. Mechanical damage. Uh, also, in coastal ecosystems, can occur in a number of ways. Uh, for example, in many countries, unfortunately, it, it is still legal to cut mangroves. Also, other activities like boat anchoring or even damage uh, caused by inexperienced divers can kill colonies of corals and other important components of marine ecosystems. Illegal dumping of waste and, and plastics affects the whole ocean, including coastal areas. A common reality in many countries is that people living on the upper parts of the watersheds do not actually realize that whatever they throw into the rivers eventually most likely will make it to the coast. The photo on the left here uh, shows part of the coastline in Puerto Rico, also in my home country, with uh, materials that were carried by the river during a rain event and eventually accumulated along a beach. As in any other natural ecosystem, invasives, invasive and uh, introduced species have a profound effect on the local and native species, as the former typically become opportunistic and occupy the niche of the local ones. In the previous slide, I mentioned the case of the Northwestern Hawaiian Islands. So similarly, in the Atlantic and the Caribbean has become invaded by lionfishes in the last decades, who are endemic to the Pacific, and, who, and were apparently dumped into these other basins illegally and now has spread through the whole basin. 
like I said, due, due to the limitations of time, we're only going to be able to cover a few temperate and topical ecosystems in, in some detail, but we're planning additional webinars uh, where we're going to include some other coastal ecosystems. Today, I will briefly mention two temperate uh, systems in particular, the rocky shores and the, and the kelp forest, and three tropical uh, ecosystems, the coral reefs, seagrasses, and mangroves. Rocky shores are diverse, diverse areas and usually contain an assemblage of species, which is very characteristic. And the number of sub-resistant plants, for instance, live along the rocky shores. And there are estimates that these areas can be up to five times more productive, productive than, than temperate evergreen forests. In terms of animal complexity, these ecosystems are usually characterized by a zonation particularly for invertebrates, where those located in the upper parts of the rocky shore have some sort of protection against UV or desiccation in the form of a shell, for instance, like in the, same, in the case of snails or limpets or chitons or other mollusks, or as a hard skeleton, such as in the case of crustaceans like the rock crab that you see in the bottom photo of this slide. Remote sensing of these ecosystems is challenging, as and most studies are concentrated on studying particularly the presence of biofilms and microalgae that cover, usually covers uh, some of these rocks. Kelps are one of the most productive ecosystems of temperate latitudes in particular. Living in cold, nutrient-rich, shallow waters promotes this production. Kelp forests cover about 25% of the world's coastlines. And for example, the, these can be found all over the west coast of North America from Baja California to Alaska. The figure, the map on the right, shows the general distribution of kelps through the world and dominant genera along the different coastlines. Kelps growth is benefited from, from living in turbulent waters, as wave action and currents wash them with nutrients, which they use for their metabolism. Occurring in highly turbulent areas also aids in the dispersion of the reproductive propagules and to colonize other benthic zones. Now, because of their dependency on light for photosynthesis, kelps occur within the first, usually within the first 40 meters of water, Although some rare species have been found up to 260 meters of depth in very clear waters in the Indian Ocean and in the Mediterranean. Macrocystis is one of the most dominant genera of kelps and forms some of the biggest individuals with some of them reaching up to about 45 meters in length or height. So that's more than 130 feet for those that use the, the English system. Uh, also, kelps in general are probably some of the fastest growing types of algae, as in some cases they can grow up to about 18 inches a day, or about 45 centimeters. Many kelp species are characterized by the presence of some structures known as nematocysts which are gas-filled balloon-like structures that help in controlling the buoyancy of the, of, the, of the whole structure, the whole kelp, making it easier to reach the surface of the water. Kelps are also important, important, important in terms of the biodiversity. Hundreds of marine invertebrates and fishes depend on the kelp forest for their survival, their food, and shelter from predators. Mammals, marine mammals, such as sea otters and seals, can be found within the kelp forest. Many aquatic birds also feed on the small fishes and invertebrates that live among the blades of the kelp forest, particularly at the water surface. Now, as the kelp blade uh, occur are near the surface, uh, some indices have uh, been developed 
usually that usually have been developed for uh, LAMP purposes, such as a normalized difference vegetation index or NDVI, can also be applied to study kelps. I have, have been applied to study kelps uh, to estimate the health of these uh, magnificent organisms. The graph on the right here shows data from a recent paper by Schroeder et al. from uh, 2019, where you can see the uh, marked difference in the reflectance of an unsubmerged kelp here, uh, blade, particularly in the near infrared uh, area, compared to one just under the surface or from a spectrum collector in an area with really sparse uh, cover. Notice that even in the first centimeters of water, there's practically no, sig no signal in the near infrared, in the, in the sparse or the submerged uh, reflectance curves. Another index uh, that has also been developed, such as the floating algae uh, index that was developed by Xiaoming Hu in, in 2009. It's uh, the paper is uh, from the remote sensing of the environment. Uh, it's also also useful to map and analyze uh, the condition of these uh, uh, ecosystems, particularly at the surface. The floating algal index was particularly developed by Xiaoming Hu for salgasum or some other seaweed that lives in the uh, in the Atlantic and the Caribbean, but can also be applied to kelps. Uh, the FAI or floating algal uh, floating algal index. Uh, uses the red edge uh, region of the spectrum and the shortwave infrared re region and was specifically developed for MODIS data. And we're going to talk about MODIS uh, in a while. See that through this presentation, I've been hesitant to use the word plant to refer to the kelps uh, forest. And the reason is because kelps are actually algae, they're not real plants. Here I wanted to show you uh, a project that uh, was funded through the NASA Citizen Science for Earth Systems programs a few years ago. And this project allows for citizens to classify images, different images, containing some uh, kelp co uh, cover in, in a, a few very uh, simple steps. We're not going to go through them now. But I encourage you to go to their web page, which is uh, here shown on the screen, and you can definitely uh, become involved in this project and get more information about it. While it only contains data from California, this particular project has been very successful, and particularly with citizen science and as an educational project. The project is led by Dr. Skyle Cabana from the UCLA and Jared, Jared Burns from uh, the University of Massachusetts at Boston. And uh, they lead a team which is actually composed of uh, almost 10 different uh, copies. So uh, for those of you interested in citizen science and particularly uh, related to coastal ecosystems, I definitely encourage you guys to see, to go to the webpage and take a look at this particular project. Okay, so let's go to the tropics now for a while. Through the session, uh, mostly on sessions two and three, I will show data and images, particularly from the Caribbean, since most of my work has been done in Puerto Rico, from where I'm originally from. Uh, let's talk about coral reefs uh, for a moment, and then we're gonna move on to other different types of, uh, of ecosystems. Coral reefs are probably the most diverse uh, ecosystem on the planet, definitely. There's no doubt about that. And uh, they typically, uh, there's some characteristics that need to be uh, in place and physical parameters. Uh, so for coral reefs to develop, one of them is that they typically exist between 30 degrees north and 30 degrees south of the equator. The reason is that these are tropical waters are, are relatively warm waters, usually uh, around 25 to 29 degrees centigrade. And uh, in coral reefs in particular, as I'll show you in a moment, it's particularly challenging to map uh, these uh, magnificent, magnificent ecosystems because they are really, really heterogeneous. Uh, so, uh, as you'll see, in any given pixel, you can find just about anything there. Um, reefs 
usually extend beyond the depths that we can usually rely reliably use uh, remote sensing data. Most in most cases, um, we should, we when we use, when we work with remote sensing data for coral in particular, we try to uh, stay above the first 10, 15 meters of water particularly in really clear waters. Beyond that, it's really, really hard to distinguish anything just because of the uh, absorption of water in the, uh, of light in the water column. But that's gonna be the theme for session, session two in particular next week. So stay tuned for that. Here's a, here's a, a, a map of what is known as the coral triangle which is, is probably the area in the world in the world that has the most uh, biodiversity in terms, in terms of coral species um, in the Indo, is in the Indo-Pacific and uh, and in total comparing uh, not only in the Indo-Pacific but in general on a worldwide basis there are more than 700 described hard coral species uh, so far I think the numbers actually about probably about 800 or more maybe depending on on on, on who you talk to and uh and when you compare the indo-pacific here and you can actually in the uh, you see the number of coral species in some of these areas for instance in indonesia and uh, in some parts of indonesia and uh, and others in the java sea in particular you can find more than 500 species in any given area so it's really really diverse um the Caribbean has about one tenth of the number of coral species uh, than the Indo-Pacific, and the reason is that the Caribbean is a much younger basin. Uh, and uh, actually, we know that because in the fossil record of the of in the Caribbean, species, uh, particular genera from the Pacific, has been found in the fossil record of the Caribbean, which means that at some point these two were connected. The, the Pacific and the Caribbean, and uh, and the, uh, eventually the, the 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 Caribbean basin uh, was closed with the Isthmus of Panama in the late Pliocene, about six to seven million years ago, and that restricted the the gene flow between the Caribbean and the Pacific basin. That is why the the Caribbean has much less species of corals, in particular, than the Pacific. Now I mentioned a little bit about this uh, earlier. Bush, uh, just to re-emphasize, uh, corals, they own their uh, ability to create complex ecosystems through their symbiotic relationship with a microscopic uh, photosynthetic dinoflagellate, a microscopic algae known as uh, sosantelli. And uh, sosantelli, uh, being photosynthetic, um, uses light from the sun to produce uh, organic matter and uh, an oxygen, and then about 80 to 90 percent of those products are passed on to the coral, and the coral uses them for its uh, nutrition. And then eventually, those uh, the the, uh, the products of respiration go back uh, to the sosantelli, uh, CO2 and um, and water and nutrients, and the whole process starts again. So it's a really efficient recycling system. The, um, but corals are not the only ones, and so are not the only ones that have uh, photosynthetic pigments. And many other organisms in the coral reef also have these pigments, algae, seagrasses, uh, among others. And, uh, and they have similar, very similar pigments, We're talking chlorophylls, carotenes, and xanthophylls. And this is going to be important for what I'm going to be talking about next in the next slide. And why? Well, because uh, it is important because uh, within in a, in, a, in any given coral reef because of the uh, its, uh, complexity within any given pixel that's either airborne or satellite pixel you can find anything from hard coral seagrasses uh, soft corals which are gorgonians algae dead coral rubble sand sponges etc you name it this is an example from, from Puerto Rico, actually, where you see uh, the, the analyze image here on the, on the top right of, uh, of one of the uh, coral reefs there in La Palguera in the southwest coast of Puerto Rico. This is called Enrique Reef. And in this case, this image has a, a pixel size of about four meters. And just kind of to represent what the amount of uh, organisms that you can find in within a four by four uh, pixel, here's a, here's a, a, a photo of an experiment I, I did a few years ago 
where it, it, it has a, a PVC a photo quadrant of four by four meters, and it's divided into uh, different sections. And you see that we, even, even within uh, four by four meters, you can find corals, uh, soft corals, dead corals, uh, sponges, and others. So it's really, really complex. And, uh, and here's uh, the same area that uh, the same uh, coral reef and the same uh, image that was uh, uh, that I mentioned in the previous slide. Um, for instance, uh, when I first uh, saw the, the 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 classification of this particular area, I noticed that uh, that uh, some of these areas, and I've been diving in those areas for more than 20 years, and I noticed that some of them were not classified correctly. And when I when I looked deep into the area. I know that in, for, for instance, in this, I'm, I'm, I'm by any case uh, here, what the colors mean is uh, blue is sand, green is uh, seagrass, and red is coral. So in this, in this, uh, for instance, in, in this particular pixel, uh, it is classified as a, as, as a, as a seagrass, or maybe a combination of seagrass and, and corals. And what happens is that, for instance, there's a mix of seagrass and other organisms there. These are zoanthids, which are um, very familiarized with. It's, it's really the same, the same group of, of corals. And here is an absorption curve which, that shows the differences between them. So this creates uh, a problem uh, eventually when analyzing uh, images, uh, depending on the pixel size, right? You might be identifying things that are just not there, or it just might be a mix of different components. So this one makes a uh, you know a, a remote sensing of coral reefs particularly interesting, and other coastal ecosystems as well. Here's a, a graph that shows the uh, the differences in terms of the spectral curves of different uh, components. Acropora selvicornis is a stackhorn coral from the Caribbean. Palitoa is a zoanthid, kind of similar to the one that you you saw in the last uh, uh, in the last slide. Rhizophora mangle is a mangrove, a red mangrove, and thalassia is a seagrass. And you see here in this graph the differences in the in the spectral curves of them. So, for instance, uh, one thing to notice is that corals and zoanthids are particularly similar. They have pretty much the same pigments, the same composition of pigments. And even though, uh, for instance, in this case, uh, these uh, thalassia and rhizophora they are you know high pl higher plants, you can see that there's a there's a pretty big difference between them. Yeah, so not necessarily because they are, you know, green plants. They have exactly the same, the same uh, pigment components. So this is also it's particularly interesting when analyzing and when trying to separating different components of a coral reef. And I included the uh, uh, mangrove here because in many coral reef areas you have uh, small islands between in, in the in, in the coral reef that have also a mangrove component. Okay, let's talk a little bit about uh, seagrass meadows, seagrasses or seagrass beds. Uh, they are really, really, also really important uh, shallow water ecosystems in the tropics. They are particularly important in carbon sequestration, and uh, and they are also very, very important in stabilizing the sediment and nutrients, particularly within the root systems, and this helps. And for instance, whenever in areas where there are seagrasses and they are or combine seagrasses with coral reefs, they uh, do, uh, the, the the root systems uh, contain some of the sediments and do not allow the sediments to eventually reach the coral reefs. Seagrasses are also important for providing habitat for reproduction and nursery, as well as uh, direct food a food source for particularly for commercially important and ecologically important uh, uh, fish and shellfish species as well as endangered species such as manatees, uh, dugongs, or even uh, sea turtles. Here, here, here are two different graphs that show the seagrasses and the and, uh, and you can see the house how very similar they are in terms of their spectral uh, curve. It's really really hard to separate these three different uh, different uh, genera of seagrasses, even with derivative analysis, it's still hard, it's really, really similar. So in general, we, we use, uh, uh, we just classify them uh, as just one component, seagrass. Uh, 
mangroves uh, are plants that are salt tolerant plants, so known as uh, halophytes, and they're adapted to live in coastal areas, so like seagrass beds, mangroves, they provide uh, many ecosystem services, such as uh, stabilization of sediments, also nursing areas uh, for fish and shellfish, um, protection of the coastline in particular. Mangroves are also really important in carbon sequestration. They they capture more carbon than even tropical forests, uh, rainforest. Uh, and mangroves are also typically dominated by a few sp species within, with a zonation based on the resistance to salt concentration in the soil. Uh, red mangroves, for instance, usually live in co contact with the ocean and then usually it, it is followed by a black or white mangrove or some other types. Here is uh, some data that I've collected, uh, actually fairly recent, and uh, I'm still analyzing some of it, but I wanted to show you guys that uh, also similarly to seagrasses, mangrove species are very hard to uh, separate between them. There have been some papers that have been published with some data that has uh, uh, have separated some uh, some uh, mangrove species, particularly using uh, derivative analysis also. But here you can see that uh, even though in healthy plants they're relatively you know similar in terms of the spectral curve, uh, plants that, uh, that have uh, 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 senescent uh, leaves, you see particularly within in the in red mangrove that it's really, really different uh, from the others and relatively simple to uh, to identify. Of course, this is in situ data collected in the field with a spectral radiometer. This is not data uh, from a particular image because uh, you need a really, really, really small pixel size to uh, detect this and you will need hyperspectral data, which we'll talk about it in a moment. Okay. So let's talk about, uh, now let's talk a little bit about satellites and sensors typically used for storing coastal and marine ecosystem. Now there are some considerations that you need to take into account when choosing satellite data for, for these ecosystems. You need to take into account the temporal resolution of the data acquisition, whether it's daily, weekly, monthly, the spatial resolution, well, it depends on the satellite or whether it's uh, airborne data. It could be from meters to uh, kilometers. There's some satellites, uh, particularly uh, private uh, commercial satellites that can, that can be uh, sub-meter uh, resolution. And, uh, and, uh, and, in, and the spatial resolution there, uh, uh, that you choose will depend also on the uh, particular ecosystem that you're evaluating. The spectral resolution of it, um, either multispectral or hyperspectral, and where uh, it does, particularly where in the electromagnetic spectrum of the satellite bands. The longevity of the satellite mission, for instance, Landsat has by far the longest record in satellite data since, uh, since the 1970s. So there's a good record there that you can do time series analysis uh, for, parts for, for some of these areas. Um, the geographical and atmospheric conditions at the study sites. Coastal ecosystems, in general, they tend to be small, for instance, seagrass beds or, or small patch reefs. And tropical zones typically have uh, a lot of clouds uh, year round. So maybe even if, if, there, if the temporal resolution is particularly, hey, let's say on a weekly or, or, or by a weekly basis, such as Landsat, then you might not even might not end up using a lot of uh, images just because there's mo there's there's, there's uh, a lot of clouds in, in the area. Is the data available uh, freely available, or is there any cost associated uh, with the data? That's something that also to uh, take into consideration. Um, particularly in, you know, in the case of NASA, all, all NASA data is uh, is freely available. And if there are any other uh, missions that are being planned. So for instance, uh, I'll mention two of them, the surface biology and geology is uh, scheduled for launch in about 2025, uh, if approved, and will have a spatial resolution of about 30 meters, so kind of similar to the Landsat resolution. Phase, the plankton aerosol cloud ocean ecosystem, uh, sensor is scheduled for launch in 2022 and we have a, a 
a spatial resolution of about one kilometer. The advantage of both of these is as these are uh, hyperspectral sensors, or will be hyperspectral sensors. Here are some advantages of uh, satellite uh, observations. Well, there, uh, there, there are many differences between data from various uh, remote sensing uh, sources. There's some common characteristics uh, also that we have to take into account. The scale and the availability uh, also, uh, it's, uh, it's important. Uh, for large regions, uh, uh, there's a, a, a you can you can have a you can cover particularly large regions with a, with a number of, of, of different uh, data. The the continuity of the data uh, also is important. The consistency and the comparability, uh, whether you can use the same data to do uh, multiple uh, uh, comparison between countries. Um, there's a diversity of measurements from spectral refractance that can be used to monitor, for instance, vegetation health among our own coastal areas or even uh, soil moisture or other parameters. And uh, also, uh, important, it's important to consider that uh, remote sensing data can be used in conjunction with field-based observations, which often serve as uh, cross-validation uh, measures. And as I said uh, earlier, uh, data, and particularly NASA data, is mostly free and have uh, open access. So here's uh, a couple of uh, early earlier satellite missions in the for the coastal zone. The coastal zone color scanner, uh, or CCCS, was launched in 1978 on board the Nimbus 7 satellite, and it lasted up to uh, 1986. It was specifically intended for monitoring oceans and, and other water bodies, um, primarily for uh, ocean color and, and temperature. Had a, they had the advantage that had a global coverage of six days, and uh, I had six, six different bands, so it was on a multispectral, four in the visible, one the near infrared, and one thermal band for temperature. Uh, it had a spatial resolution pixel size of about 825 meters. Sea Waves, the sea viewing wide field of view sensor, was launched in 1997 on board the uh, Sea Star platform. The mission ended in 2010, so it's about 13 years of data there. And it was designed uh, also for ocean monitoring. Okay, so Sea Waves, there had uh, eight different uh, spectral bands, six in the visible and two in the near infrared. Had a spatial resolution, uh, depending on the band of about between uh, anywhere from 1.1 uh, to 4.5 kilometers. But it had a revisit time of one day. So every single day you get uh, one image from a particular area. And see which was particularly used uh, for a long time to estimate uh, uh, ocean primary production, so phytoplankton processes and other types of oceanographic processes. Here are some of the more uh, current uh, satellite missions. The, uh, the Landsat 7, the Landsat series in particular has been collecting data since 1972, but Landsat 7 has been in orbit since uh, 1999 and will be eventually replaced by Landsat 9. That was originally scheduled uh, for launch in 2020. Um, since uh, 2003, the sensor, the uh, Landsat 7, uh, acquired and delivered data with gaps uh, due to a failure, but still about 75% of the data is useful. Landsat 8 has been collecting data since 2013, and its main uh, optical sensor is the operational land imager. And Landsat 8 in particular has a coastal band of 440 nanometers, uh, which the others in the Landsat series didn't have. And it's particularly useful for studying coastal processes like phytoplankton plumes and others. Terra and Aqua both contain the moderate resolution imaging uh, spectrohaliometer or MODIS, and has been uh, in orbit since the late 1990s and early uh, 2000s. And uh, more recently, the SOMI uh, National Polar Partnership uh, platform 
uh, is uh, has been in orbit since uh, since uh, since 2011, and uh, SOMI uh, MPP has the Visible Infrared Imaging Radiometer Suite or BIRS, which has a similar configuration as MODIS, and it's expected to eventually replace it in the next few years. And like I said, BIRS has been collecting data since about the early uh, 2012. And finally, uh, from the European side, the Sentinel series has proven very useful for coastal and land studies, particularly because it's and uh, it's a similarity with the Landsat bands, and also because of the slightly higher uh, spatial resolution. So in the next slide, we'll see some of the general characteristics of some of these sensors. Here's a, a table that shows uh, the characteristics of some of them. Uh, the Landsat, Landsat 7 that had the, the enhanced thematic, thematic mapper, uh, and Landsat 8 with the operational uh, land imager or OLI, uh, they both have a, a similar resolution and also a similar SWAT and a, and a temporal resolution of 16 days. Uh, MODIS on board. Uh, Terra and Aqua, uh, one to two day uh, revisit in terms of in terms of modis, depending on the band. Uh, it has a spatial resolution between 250 uh, meters to one kilometer. VIRS has a spatial resolution of about 35, uh, uh, 375 meters to 750 meters, depending on the band, and also has a one to two day uh, revisit time. And uh, in terms of the Sentinel uh, satellites, uh, Sentinel 2 and 2, 2A and 2B has a multispectral uh, imager, MSI, and Sentinel 3A has the ocean and land color instrument, or OLSI. Uh, Sentinel 2, um, uh, 2A and 2B, they, uh, they again, the, depending on the band, the resolution is anywhere between 10 and 60 meters at a five day revisit time. And Sentinel-3 uh, has a slightly uh, lower resolution, so 300 meters, and also a lower uh, temporal resolution, about 27 days of revisit. But it has a, a larger, much larger swap. OK, uh, here's a, uh, some data in regards to the uh, differences between, or, uh, between multispectral and hyperspectral particularly in the uh, availability of some of them. Um, as, as, uh, as most of you might know, uh, the multispectral satellites have been the norm uh, pretty much through, through the last uh, the decades. And, uh, and the, the, the disadvantage is that there is a limited number of spectral bands that can be used. On the other hand, it has an advantage that, the, that there's a longevity of data sets. For instance, in the cases of Landsat and MODIS, the case of Landsat, there are several decades of data. In the case of MODIS, there's about a decade and a half or so, or almost two decades there. Um, and also, most of these sensors, they have a fairly high temporal resolution. Uh, MODIS is daily to one to two days. And Landsat is about 16 days uh, revisit time. Now, there hasn't been that much uh, hyperspectral sensors, particularly satellite-based sensors out there. Um, I just want to mention here uh, a couple of them. One of them is Hyperion, which was on board the uh, EO, EO-1 uh, spacecraft. Hyperion was decommissioned in 2017 and had a, a perimeter spatial resolution, but it had 220 bands uh, at 10 nanometers uh, bandwidth. So it was particularly useful. Uh, some hyperspectral sensors are mission specific. Uh, for instance, the hyperspectral imager for the coastal ocean or HICO so is on board the International Space Station. And uh, HICO uh, was uh, aimed at particular targets. So there's no, there's no uh, HICO data for the whole uh, coastal ocean, but just particular sites. And uh, so it's a limited data set. And it only uh, worked from in between uh, 2009 and 2014 also. Now, uh, in terms of uh, hyperspectral sensors, most of the development has been actually for airborne-based uh, sensors. And uh, here's a few of them. 
particularly three of them that were developed by the Jet Propulsion Lab. The Airborne Visible Infrared Imaging Spectrometer, or AVRIS, has been used for, it was mostly developed for LAM uh, targets, but has also been used for coastal targets in, in many parts of the world. It was used uh, extensively during the Hispiri uh, preparatory mission campaign a couple of years ago in Hawaii, for instance, and in other areas, other coastal areas. Uh, the the average ne uh, next generation, new generation, is a is a continuation of the of the original average. So the, the people usually call this also the average classic. And uh, also the the lately the portable remote imaging spectrometer or prism was used during the NASA funded uh, Earth Venture Coral mission. Uh, and, uh, Dr. Eric Hochberg from the Bermuda Institute is the uh, PI of that particular mission. And lately, there's been a development of actually hyperspectral cameras for uh, unmanned airborne systems or drones. And this looks particularly promising because for once they're hyperspectral, so, and some of them have a, a spectral resolution a bandwidth of about two or three nanometers, and also being uh, for uh, for drones, for, for UASs, you will have a really high spatial resolution as well. So probably there's a, there's the combination of high spectral resolution and high spatial resolution, which for coastal ecosystem is particularly useful. So here I wanted to show you uh, the differences between uh, what it looks like with hyperspectral versus multispectral data in terms of the remote sensing reflectance. But this is particularly for total suspended matter concentrations for a paper from the Bernardo et al. in 2017. You see the there's a much more information with hyperspectral that you can get uh, from what you can get from from multispectral, where you have only a very limited amount of points in the within the visible or uh, the near infrared. Here's some data uh, from basically the same reef that I showed you earlier and uh, and when I, uh, when I talked about the, the components of a particular pixel. And here you see this is data that was collected from with, with the average sensor uh, in Puerto Rico about in around 2004. And it shows how this process data, what you're seeing here in the in the graphs in gray here, already process data from average. And it shows how similar or dissimilar the data is with um, when you compare it with actual in situ data, reflectance data collected with a spectral heaviometer uh, on site. And for instance, in the case of corals, you see that it's it's, it's really it's, it's relatively similar. Uh, particularly, some of the peaks, the, the main peaks uh, where they uh, reflect. For seagrasses, it's uh, it's uh, it's also very similar uh, as well. <clears throat> and uh, and also for in the case of uh, of sand, we see here some of the peaks. And in sand, you will always have the uh, the reduction in in the reflectance in the in in the red, not necessarily because of the grain, sand grains, but because there's microalgae, microscopic algae within the sand grains, which is actually absorbing some of the light. So that's why you see uh, some of it. The differences between the, uh, the the measures collected in situ versus what you see with the sensors are based uh, because of two different two different factors that are uh, affecting it. Uh, the sensor in particular. One of them is that there is a water column uh, there, and in, in, in this area in particular, is, even though we're talking about a few feet of water, it's still absorbs some of the light and it affects the, eventually the, the product that you get. And also the other one, as I mentioned earlier, in any given pixel, in a four by four meter pixel, you can have a, a distribution of different components, venti components that are affecting the signal. And that's why you don't get a real a perfect uh, correlation between uh, them. But you, have, you get some of the main features with a, a particularly with this uh, hyperspectral data and it proves the, the usefulness of uh, hyperspectral data uh, in regards to particularly to uh, coastal marine ecosystems. So, what happened then? What happens then if, let's say, 
that you don't have uh, that there's you're working in an, in a in an area that has uh, does not allow for a direct assessment of the conditions on the seafloor. As for instance, if there's an area that is too turbid or too green and the light does not penetrate enough to allow for benthic characterization, then you can use at least the available sensor data to assess water quality and then indirectly assess the health of the submerged ecosystems. These are some of the widely used water quality indicators for uh, both uh, freshwater and marine ecosystems. Uh, CDOM, coral dissolved organic matter, or, or also dissolved organic matter, both of them are, are used, and re they result from the decay of uh, uh, tritos in the water column. The uh, sea surface temperature, also uh, chlorophyll A for phytoplankton, phytoplankton functional types, uh, also. Uh, salinity, some of the other uh, parameters that can be measured just to see the entrance of uh, fresh water, for instance, into the coastal ecosystems, total suspended solids or total suspended matter. Uh, also, there's a there's a measure called fluorescent lines, fluorescence line height, which is a relative measure of the amount of radiance leaving the water column, uh, presumably as a result of the fluorescence of uh, chlorophyll A in particular. And also another parameter is the euphoric depth, which is the depth where the photosynthetically active radiation of PAR or PAR is at 1% of the uh, surface. So whenever a quality quality study is performed using remote sensing uh, data, it's vital to collect in situ data, also to validate the image processing analysis. Some of the most important uh, among the many parameters typically sampled are uh, chlorophyll A and total suspended solids. Different types of radiometers are uh, commercially uh, available, and the sensitivity to specific wavelengths vary from instrument to instrument. But also, usually, water samples are collected and processed in the lab for pigment analysis or concentration of, of particles. Why? So, each of these constituents, as you see here in the uh, graph, they absorb light at a particular wavelength. And hence, knowing how much each of them is, pres is uh, present in the water column is important in order to interpret the spectral signal that you receive by the sensor, either in orbit or airborne. The signal will also be affected by the inherent and apparent optical properties of the water media. And we're gonna talk about IOPs or inherent, or inherent optical properties in the next slide. But apparent optical properties depend on the uh, IOPs and on the geometry of the light regime. Some of these properties have already been discussed in previous RCET webinars, actually, like the one, the water quality monitoring uh, webinar that was offered some time ago, and also in the freshwater, remote sensing of freshwater systems webinar from last year. Uh, so these properties include uh, upwelling radiance, water leaving radiance, remote sensing reflectance. And when you look at the graph here on the, on the, on the right, you see the different regions of the spectrum. In this case, uh, in the visible and near infrared, where the different constituents uh, reflect. So for example, chlorophyll A reflects more on the green part of the spectrum, which is why we see the plants green, and absorb more in the blue and red, where sediments absorb more in the blue on infrared and reflects more on the yellow to red region of the spectrum. Here's the equation from remote sensing reflectance. Uh, I'm not gonna go into uh, details of, about this, but I wanna mention the light absorption and, and backscattering by the different constituents of the water column, column go, govern the color of light. Uh, the, the amount of light that the sensor detects. And uh, this particular is uh, 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 an equation for, for absorption. And you see that uh, the absorption of light depends, depends on, for instance, on the amount of uh, phytoplankton or sediment or water or even coral dissolved organic matter. And also uh, the whole uh, reflectance also. Uh, depends on the on the backscattering uh, properties of the water. And on, the, on the right, you see a Landsat image of the Mississippi River plume, where you see the influence of the different water constituents in the water, in the color of the water. 
Okay, so next week uh, we're going to explore in more detail the different water quality parameters useful for characterizing coastal waters and how this affects affect the penetration of light in the water column. Now remember that you can contact me or my colleague Amy McCollum on the emails shown on the screen for specific inquiries about the RCET program in particular. You can contact our program director, Dr. Ana Parados. And you can also find more information about the program and additional trainings on the RCEP web website shown on the screen. Thank you very much for your attention. We're going to take some questions now. Feel free to write them down in the, in the, in the webinar chat. And we're going to try to answer some of them now, and then the rest will be answered in the Q&A Google form that will eventually become available on the website by the end of this week. So thank you very much. And we're going to go into questions now. <laughs>